Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Against His Story Against Leviathan by Freddie Perlman, Black and Red Publishing, 1983. The key idea of this text is, of course, to explain and critique the concepts His Story and Leviathan. The main concept here is Leviathan. Leviathan is essentially a metaphor for civilization, for alienated forced labor, repressive hierarchy, and imperialist expansion. Leviathan is described metaphorically as a mechanical beast with a head full of hierarchical leaders which control a body full of slaves which power the beast, and fangs and claws made up of armies of conquest and expansion. Whereas Perlman explains it, he might think of it as a worm, a giant worm, not a living worm, but a carcass of a worm, a monstrous cadaver, its body consisting of numerous segments, its skin pimpled with spears and wheels and other technological implements. He knows from his own experience that the entire carcass is brought to artificial life by the motions of the human beings trapped inside. The Zex, who operate the springs and wheels just as he knows that the cadaverous head is operated by a mere Zek, the head Zek. Zek is a slang term for a labor camp inmate in the USSR. Just a little bit of anti-communist terminology here, it's a pepper throughout the text. The other term here is his story. His story means the Western understanding of knowledge, of history and sciences categorized by conquest and progress. Or as Perlman states, when we think of real history, of history proper, we mean his story. It's an exclusively masculine affair. If women make their appearance in it, they do so wearing armor and wielding a phallus shape. Such women are masculine. Now, because of the vagueness of this writing, I'll give two readings. A critical reading would say that many radical environmentalist and radical feminist types have a sort of mythical belief around motherhood and mother earth and goddesses and femininity to a practically sexist degree. And so perhaps Perlman falls into this same biological determinism camp that certain radical environmentalists and radical feminists fall into. A generous reading, though, would argue that perhaps the feminine-masculine distinction just hasn't aged well, and terms like guarded and unguarded, or aggressive and vulnerable, could be used as synonyms. Either way, when I think about this his story concept, I think of the game Civilization, where you conquer the surrounding barbarians and progress through technological advancement and expansion to forge a great empire. Against His Story, Against Leviathan explains these concepts through a slow, complex explanation of the history of pre- and early capitalist exploitation, alienation, and expansion from around 5000 BCE to about the mid-1800s. Though to be honest, it's kind of hard to pin down the dates exactly because in this against his story stance, the text is very much coming from an anti-Western science style anarchism I have typically seen associated with radical environmentalists and radical feminists. The text has virtually no numbers in it. No numbers, no facts, no figures, no cited sources. One of the few times Perlman comes close to stating a specific date is in the last chapter where he says, the resistance goes on for 16 generations, four leviathanic centuries, during which the beast's entrails are a perpetually armed camp and the inmates' first business is war. Now, I can understand this sentiment. Western science and history and terminology often act in the service of power and capital and is very dismissive and destructive of issues of justice, particularly environmental and feminist issues, for example. So it makes sense that a text critiquing Western society would also critique the terminology and methodology of Western science and history. But for the sake of being understood by the reader, I think this does more harm than good. I don't mean to understate this point. The text is highly metaphorical, but this is an animal farm. The text literally follows an in-depth and chronological account of thousands of years of history, and yet provides no dates, numbers, statistics, or sources. It would have been better to use commonly understood terms and some numbers and sources for the sake of the reader, but then to frequently reiterate why these terms are insufficient, rather than using intentionally obscure terms and totally avoiding facts and sources with little or no explanation. With that said, let's take a look at the text in depth. Chapter 1. At the start of the text, Perlman defines wilderness. 
wilderness embraces all of nature and human communities beyond civilizations can. Now, sure, there's plenty wrong with the world, but Perlman sees most leftists as not going far enough. He states, Marxists point at the capitalist mode of production, sometimes only at the capitalist class. Anarchists point at the state. Comet points at capital. New ranters, of which Perlman is a part, points at technology or civilization or both. The Marxist sees only the moat in the enemy's eye. They fail to see that the anti-capitalist mode of production wants only to outrun its brother in wrecking the biosphere. Okay, so we basically see Perlman's stance here. Other forms of leftism are insufficient and will, like the current system, wreck the biosphere, and Perlman's enemies are technology and civilization. We can see where Perlman is coming from through his explanations of non-civilized communities and wilderness as a whole. We cannot know what it was to feel the seed in the womb and to learn to feel the seed in the earth's womb, to feel as the earth feels, and at last abandon oneself and let earth possess one, to become earth to become the first mother of all life. Chapter 2 through 10. These chapters are about the very beginning of his story, from the very first civilizations of the Fertile Crescent to the Crusades. Perlman talks about the very first exploitative political and military leaders, the very first alienating forced labor projects, and the first class divisions. Perlman explains the maintaining of the waterworks in the Fertile Crescent. Perlman explains that maintaining the waterworks required forced labor, which encouraged slavery, and this system needed protection through permanent armies, and this system required expansion, and expansion leads to resistance. And whether fighting for survival or resisting capture, groups that were against the first Leviathan ended up becoming Leviathanized themselves because the resources and soldiers needed to fight a Leviathan necessitated permanent standing armies and forced labor to maintain them and then look all of a sudden you're a leviathan as well it's here that perlman gives the definition of leviathan i used at the start of the video and perlman argues the feat of launching a leviathan will be considered a sign of genius but is this feat a sign of genius or of mental disability who but imbeciles would step out of the state of nature and into the entrails of an artificial worm's carcass for no good reason. Perlman then describes people who are outside of Leviathan and states, these people are still in touch with women who leave their bodies and visit the underworld, with men who extend themselves towards the sky and fly, with people who actually speak to the jackal and the ibex, for the god still mingles with the people. These people are described as free, often something more than free. The vague writing here doesn't clarify if it's just using metaphor to describe the feeling of freedom or if it's talking about psychedelics or referring to some kind of spiritualism in the witchcraft and meditating with crystals type of flying and talking to gods but that's the nature of the text people who are part of civilization are described quite differently they're described as corpses and springs and gears and armored and masked Perlman states People never become altogether empty shells. A glimmer of life remains in the faceless and cis and zex, the middle and working class people, who seem more like springs and wheels than like human beings. They are, after all, the living beings responsible for the cadavers coming to life. They are the ones who reproduce, wean, and move the Leviathan. Its life is but a borrowed life. It neither breathes nor breeds. It is not even a living parasite. It is an excretion, and they are the ones who excrete it. It's here in the text that Perlman defines his story, which I quoted at the start of the video. Okay, so we've seen that pre-civilized cultures are described in dreamlike states, and the people of civilization are described as slaves forced into springs and gears to occupy a mechanical corpse. All of this, of course, leads to some anti-technology, anti-innovation quotes. For example, Archimedes will sell the power of the visionary to a tyrant who will turn them against life itself, against Mother Earth. This Archimedes will boast, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. And when the tyrant kills with the inventor's levers and pulleys, Archimedes will shout, Eureka! Now, again, a good faith reading would say he strictly means violent technology or the use of technology for violence. 
guns, bombs, prisons, and the like. But I suspect he probably means any technology that causes harm to the biosphere, such as mining, might fall under this definition of a killing machine. I mean, throughout the text he refers to technology in general as killing machines. Hell, he practically calls levers and pulleys killing machines. Now, before we get to the next chunk of chapters, I have to explain that I described these first 10 chapters fairly concisely, but the text is not at all written in this way. Maybe it's the fact that Perlman refuses to use any dates, facts, figures, or sources, so his account doesn't really function like a history text, or maybe it's just the dry, super overabundance of specific groups and peoples described in so little detail, or maybe it's simply the vague metaphorical way in which the text is written, but I found these first 10 chapters incredibly tedious. If I were recommending this text, I'd say skim the first 10 chapters or so, so that you get the main concepts down, but the text doesn't really start taking off until chapter 11. Here, here's a generic example of the text to show you what I mean. Perlman states, Mycenaean Greeks were already in Anatolia and on the Greek mainland during the heyday of the Hittite Leviathan. Mycenaean vases, dating from the mid-Hittite period, will be found in Cyprus, Egypt, and the Levant, and as far as Sicily and Ireland. Mycenaean olive oil must have been transported to all these places by Phoenician ships, since there will be no evidence of a large commercial Mycenaean fleet. They made occasional use of a script, but had neither a king nor a permanent army. Their former community had shattered, but they had not yet encased themselves in a leviathan of their own. Although their Theseus tried hard, they either joined Hittites on conscript hunts, or else went tribute hunting on their own. Newcomers of almost identical speech didn't treat them as kin, but as enemies. The Mycenaeans fortified their towns and held off the newcomers, probably with Hittite aid. Almost immediately after the demise of the Hittites, one after another of the Mycenaean strongholds began to fall to the Ionian and Dorian Greeks. <sighs> it's over a hundred pages of this. I almost suspect it was written in this way to turn away readers, like maybe Perlman only wanted a select few getting to the later chapters. Who knows? Let's continue. Chapter 11 through 18. These chapters cover the Crusades to just before the European expansion into America. To start, Perlman explains how the West justifies its actions to itself. Prevarication becomes the West's major art. From the day when a church official names himself the Vicar of Christ and a Goth parades his puppet as Emperor of Rome, to the day when the biggest empire of Zex in Leviathan's entire his story will speak of itself as the free world. Everything in the West is a lie. The Western spirit is not only against wilderness, it is against nature, as well as humanity, against truth, as well as beauty. In order for us to maintain our way of living, we must tell lies to each other, and especially to ourselves. It's not necessary that the lies be particularly believable. The lies act as barriers to truth. Now, not everyone is part of this, the West, and I do appreciate the brief little histories of radical groups that I think us anarchists could call kindred spirits, but I think Perlman misrepresents these outsiders. He claims that they were all consciously against the concept of Leviathan, which they weren't, and that their opposition was like-minded, which it wasn't. He states, We will know from the Roman writers that the skirmishes become more frequent, that several federated bands gang up against Roman strongholds. When Franks are first mentioned by name, they arrive with Turk-speaking Alans, who originate near China. The two groups may not know each other's language, but they understand that the entire lower half of the world is occupied by something violent, beyond description. They understand that if that thing continues to spread, it means the end of freedom and the end of life. Um, do they though? Are all these disjointed groups coming together to lash out against this freedom-devouring leviathan? Or are they just lashing out against a spreading group? Lashing out in protest of their own subjugation? Or maybe they're just attacking for the sake of plunder? Motivations tied to material conditions make far more sense than those tied to metaphorical musings. Perlman then explains that history, science, and logic are the armor that the Zex wear to justify Leviathan, and art and hobbies and duty are the masks that hide the armor. Perlman states, The human face is extinguished by a Leviathanic mask, which is itself masked 
veiled, hidden. The purpose of the veils is to show the Western European as something he no longer is or never was, and to hide what he has become. Perlman claims, All this progress is fiercely resisted by its victims. Those who will refer to the Western Leviathan as we will alternate between denying this resistance and maligning it. The resistance is the only human component of the entire his story. All the rest is Leviathanic progress. Now, I totally agree that the dominant culture will outright ignore and secretly attack things like the Black Panthers or the Occupy movement, but this seems to say that all who accept any aspect of Leviathan are brainwashed, and only people who agree with Perlman are really human. Perlman concludes this chunk of chapters stating, The purpose of all seizures, confiscations, and expropriations is eminently Christian and as holy as the empire itself. The purpose is to have dominion over the fish and over the fowl and over everything that moveth upon the appropriated land. The armored European hungers to repress other sinful beings as he has repressed himself. Dominion over everything that moveth upon a privately owned piece of real estate is what makes a person a self-respecting Christian, and a good Christian is, henceforth and by definition, a world eater. Chapter 18 through 24, the start of the Western Leviathan. Perlman starts this section explaining, world eater, swallower of worlds and destroyer of the biosphere is already an apt, functionally descriptive name for the Western Leviathan at the time of its inception in the Crusades against infidels. Perlman expands on his critique of Western civilization, stating, If by culture we mean the ways and wisdom of communities of free human beings, Europe is no culture and has no culture. The last Europeans who have culture are the radicals burned by the Inquisition. What's left is civilization, something very different from culture. Civilization is a humanly meaningless web of unnatural constraints. It is the organization of repression within the entrails of Leviathan. Civilization is the culture of a Leviathan's springs and wheels, and Europeans know that their states are not communities. Their laws for the maintenance of civility are not culture, and their imposed tasks are not ways of free human beings. This is about the Marxist concept of alienation. Perlman continues, We hear someone ask, Who would ever want to leave the amenities of civilization and return to a primitive state of nature? We can now see that the questioner is Leviathan itself, simulating a human voice. Human beings, even those encased in the most formidable civilizer among Leviathans, try with all their might to burrow run and even fly out of the accumulating rubble of amenities burying them alive, and not just the radicals among them, all of them. Perlman then explains several ways and groups which are outside or against Leviathan. In fact, a healthy amount of this text is dedicated to exploring these radical outside groups, and I do appreciate that. It reminds me of Peter Lambert Wilson's discussions on anarchist spiritualism, it kind of reminds me of the book Pirate Utopias. I think it's important to explore the kindred spirits of early rebels of society, the first anarchist-esque breakaway groups. While discussing this abandonment of civilization, Perlman makes a big claim. There is no need to work in the meantime either, while waiting for the day of the final collapse, nor is there any need to starve. The expectation of the imminent collapse of the last beast is not mere wishful thinking. Oh boy, it might be a little more complicated than that. A, a generous reading, if by collapse you mean destruction of oppression and unjust hierarchies, etc., and if by no work you mean through expropriation in the conquest of bread variety, then yes, please. The critical reading, though, if by collapse you mean abandoning modern amenities to the point of necessitating death from preventable ailments and mass starvation, and increased hardships for disabled persons, then no, no thank you. But I do fully agree with Perlman's next point. The withdrawal movement is a time of self-abandon, of masks and armor removal. 
daring radicals and visionaries are embraced as kin, and every new sect has its day. All are heard and absorbed, and everyone ventures into undiscovered realms. All this abruptly ends when the self-defense begins. Self-abandon gives way to a new rigidity. Masks and armors are put on. Exotic visionaries are distrusted, then ostracized, and finally eliminated. The first part is often described as decolonizing hearts and minds, and the last part is unfortunately a common result of radical groups closing ranks, responding to repression, gatekeeping, etc. Perlman explains that some radical groups tried to militarize and institute violence, and they became like Leviathan, just like the groups mentioned earlier in the text. However, Perlman argues that other groups who were pacifists didn't suffer this fate. On witches, Perlman states, healers, navigators, builders, storytellers, and even visionaries are displaced and then silenced by state-licensed masters and doctors of medicine, astronomy, architecture, philosophy, metaphysics. Everything human beings did by themselves and for themselves is taken over by a state-licensed monopoly. The so-called witches, heiresses to ages of informally transmitted knowledge of herbs and illnesses, are known to be healers, whereas doctors, notoriously ignorant of all this lore, are intent on establishing a state-licensed monopoly over illness, so as to police the sick. Now, for me, I've mostly seen witches as heroes of the radical environmentalist and radical feminist type folks, but witches are having a great resurgence in the radical community as a whole. If you're interested in this conversation, I highly recommend Philosophy Tube's video, Witchcraft, Gender, and Marxism, and Angie Speaks' video, The Politics of Witchcraft and the Archetype of the Witch, as well as Step Back History's video, What Do Witches and Beer Have in Common? Perlman then describes the wonderful, dreamlike, perfect lives of pre-civilized Native American tribes, but Perlman admits, My brief account is deliberately idyllic. Perlman goes on to argue, The questions, who would abandon the amenities of civilization, and who would go back to digging with a stick, are rhetorical questions practiced in front of a looking glass. The renegades from civilization are notorious. They shed masks, they shed whole armors, they separate from previously indispensable amenities, and experience a shedding of an insupportable burden. The renegade is possessed, transformed, humanized. Every day our society abuses the environment. What's the easiest way to handle that pain? Don't even talk about it. Yep. And the only way to bear the horrors pretend it's real. It's real, you have to do something about it. Like this dear. Someone hurt her. Someone you trusted because you trusted the system, you trusted the government, you trusted the church. Please stop talking about it. Perlman then defines capital and technology directly. He states, Capital and technology are not mere objects, but relations of people to objects. Not levers and drills, but former human beings reduced to appendages of levers and drills. Without the human operators, the levers and drills are inert. They revert to wilderness. Now, certainly the relationships and networks between capital is very important but this definition of technology I have great contention with. It's flat out unhelpful. This definition both adopts Marxist ideas of alienation and capital relations and adds some environmentalist anti-tech fetishization. Following this style of definition of technology, I literally had someone argue with me that using a ladder to pick apples would not be technology, but using a ladder to spy on your neighbor is technology. Perlman continues, Death is the unspoken name of the superior technology. Death is the only superior culture of the communityless invader. And death is no culture at all, it is the anti-culture, the eater of culture, Leviathan. Again, I could read this generously. Most scientists are working on military projects. Western culture devotes most of its time to inventions of horrible, murderous repression like drones and life-destroying sweatshops. However, I could give this a critical reading since the text makes the claim that anything that disrupts the biosphere murders the biosphere, 
and is therefore an instrument of death. Put down that shovel, you murdering maniac. Can't you see that a tree died to make the handle and a rock died to make the blade? This is where the vague, highly metaphorical style of the text is unhelpful. Heading towards the conclusion, Perlman argues, I'm impatient to end the story of the artificial beast with human entrails. I cannot tell all, either there or here, because the struggle against his story, against Leviathan, roll credits, is synonymous with life. It is part of the biosphere's self-defense against the monster rendering her asunder. You heard it here first, folks. Perlman is impatient to finish the story of this nondescript amorphous blob he cryptically pretends to explain because it's so bad it's not worth describing and also the entire biosphere of the world hates it, so there. Perlman then discusses Thomas Morton, the Quakers, diggers, ranters, seekers, and other rebels who fight for equality and cohabitation with the environment who stood in opposition of the Puritans and progress and the Protestant work ethic. Again, I appreciate these histories of kindred spirits, of radical groups. I wish there was some more sources and some evidence provided about them. Describing the workers of Western society, Perlman states, they do not want to see themselves as Zex, but as buyers and sellers, as businessmen, even if they have nothing to sell but their labor power and can buy nothing but food with which to reproduce their labor power. A Zek with a title to a plot of land on which to reproduce his labor power is a king of his roost, lord of his realm, master of his household. Perlman argues that while many see destruction and collapse in Leviathan's future, Leviathan itself only sees progress and more progress and more progress. Again, Pullman denies that most resistors of Leviathan are going far enough. Critiquing communism, he states, The eschaton of this apocalypse is still a labor camp animated by concentrated Zex, but it can be distinguished from all previous camps by the pretentious fact that the archons of the post-revolutionary polity are all members of the paradisal party. It becomes the main project of the stunted rebels to succeed where the businessman failed, to destroy what human communities still remain, to eradicate the last traces of what Marx called primitive communism, so as to send all humanity scurrying up the escalator past his story's concentration camps toward the highest stage of moronization, the top Morris camp, the one ruled by the general secretary of the paradisal party, the ruler who calls himself the proletariat. Ha ha ha, huff huff, aren't we so smart? Let's ignore all nuance and complications and just say, well, I determine that all labor involving technology is murderous and disastrous, and since your version of an alternative society might have toothbrushes, then I have bested you. Give me a break. What are we, a bunch of cultural Marxists, too? I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. Perlman begins to close the chapter, explaining that we now have one final Leviathan that encapsulates the entire world. Having swallowed everyone and everything outside itself, the beast becomes its own soul frame of reference. It entertains itself, exploits itself, and wars on itself. It has reached the end of its progress, for there is nothing left for it to progress against except itself. Being above all else a war engine, the beast is most likely to perish once and for all in a cataclysmic suicidal war. Oh, it was awful. It was terrible. Why, why they fought and they fought and they fought until, until there was only two of them left. And that was the end of the last man on Earth. To end the text, Perlman states, Anarchic and pantheistic dancers no longer sense the artifice and its linear history as all, but as merely one cycle, one long night, a stormy night that left Earth wounded, but a night that ends, as all nights end, 
when the sun rises. Conclusion Now coming into this text, I suspected it to be like Desert by Anonymous, which you can read at the Anarchist Library website or in audiobook form from the Audible Anarchist, or like Endgame by Derek Jensen. That is to say, a book that looks at all the evidence of environmental collapse and tries to make a logical argument for averting or preparing for ecocidal collapse. However, this book is something different, something much more metaphorical. This text really has more of a Robert Anton Wilson, Joseph McKenna, Alan Watts metaphysical feel to it. Now, there's things in the text I totally disagree with, such as looking at all inventions as murderous and controlling, and the anti-left unity dismissiveness in the text, or the claim that anyone who fought against the dominant civilization is automatically part of a homogenous, consciously anti-Leviathan rebellion. I can certainly sympathize with Ozymandias' review of this book, where he states, Perlman's arrogance is infectious. He dispatches Marxism in a couple pages, the concept of bourgeois revolutions in one sentence. His method of dealing with anyone he doesn't like involves his own totalitarian circular logic. His critics are dismissed as armored. People who want some positive evidence before accepting his conclusions are guard dogs of the Leviathanic order. Perlman's anti-history is so all-explanatory, covering the whole of history in 300 pages, there must be a danger of, against his story, eventually becoming a new bible for a political dogma, the fate which befell situationist theory. An eclectic approach is needed to avoid this dead end. In learning from the culture of primitive peoples, we are not obligated to abandon everything which has been developed since the waterworks of Mesopotamia. My biggest complaint, however, would be the pacing and overload of peoples covered in the text despite their relevance to the overall message. Key concepts and ideas are lost in a sea of covering every little group's interaction chronologically for thousands of years. First, there's the section of the text which I read to demonstrate this cacophony of interactions that adds very little to the overall message. Yeah, that part. And secondly, here's a small list of peoples addressed in the text. These are just names I had jotted down while going over my notes. Sumerians, Israelites, Peloponnesians, Mycenaeans, Ionians, Dorians, Phrygians, Peranians, Chaldeans, Babylonians, Cadians, Assyrians, Persians, Scythians, Eurasians, Tolians, Syracusans, Morovians, Franciscans, Hungarians, Slavs, Gars, Vikings, Quechuans, Algonquins, Iroquoians, Albergensians, Walvians, Bergers, Granian, Hopi, Guti, Patuatomi, Caribs, and Arawaks. Phew. There's a book called Short History of Progress, which makes a very similar argument, but does so in a far more coherent and enjoyable way because it addresses a fraction of the groups and always in clear service of the overall narrative. With all that said, there are a lot of places where I agree with the book's critiques. Alienation is a problem. Justification of the current system is a problem. Blind allegiance to Western science and history and progress is a problem. Understanding why people become reactionaries is important. Understanding the exploitation and oppression of pre-capitalist societies is important. And understanding the history of radical movements like the Diggers and Quakers, Adamites and the Taborites and other kindred spirits is also important. If these subjects interest you, then you might want to go to the Anarchist Library and check out Against His Story, Against Leviathan. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.